I'm Bob Dickey, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Darshan Shaw. Dr. Shaw is a health and wellness specialist, well-known surgeon, published author, tech entrepreneur, and founder and CEO of Butology and Next Health. As an expert on all body systems, he has performed over 10,000 surgical procedures, including trauma surgery, general surgery, and plastic and reconstructive procedures. As a health and wellness specialist, he's advised thousands of patients on how to optimize their well-being and extend their lifespan, culminating in the creation of Nextel, the Apple store of health and wellness, which offers health span and lifespan extending technology and treatments in a beautiful and welcoming environment. Dr. Shaw started his training at an accelerated MD program at the age of 15 and at the University of Missouri and earned his medical degree at the age of 21, becoming one of the youngest doctors in the United States. After surgical training in Central California, Dr. Shaw then continued his training at the Mayo Clinic, one of the most prestigious medical institutes in the country. After earning his board certification, he went on to open medical and surgical centers throughout California, as well as starting innovative tech companies, creating patented medical devices, as well as advising dozens of startups in medicine, finance, and tech. Dr. Shaw's belief in continued education and self-improvement has earned him alumni status at Harvard Business School, Singularity University, and he is also a member of the Young Presidents Organization, also known as YPO. Dr. Shaw lives in Malibu, California with his wife and two children and loves to travel, exercise, and has a passion to continuously educate himself and others. I know you're going to learn a lot from the following discussion, so let's jump right in. Well, Dr. Shaw, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. And I, I tell you what, we've had so many of our uh, mutual friends and classmates asking me to get, get you on and a- interview you, uh, get your expertise on all things longevity and living a, a healthy life. And I really want to start with your your origin story, because as I go back, and I, I knew you were quite an accomplished individual. I've always enjoyed chatting with you. And as I was reviewing your resume, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a real life Doogie Hauser. So you get your, you start your medical training at the age of 15. You graduate medical school at the age of 21. You go on and you work in the Mayo Clinic. You've got over 10,000 different medical procedures. You've got this illustrious medical career. And it, like you were one of the youngest doctors in America to earn your medical degree, and I, I'd like to start right there. What what inspired you at such a young age to want to get involved in uh, the medical practice and um, you know to, to 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 serve in that capacity? And thank you once again for being on the program. Right, you know, oh, oh, you're so welcome, Robert. It's so fantastic to speak to, uh, you know, our fellow HBS classmates. This is awesome to be here and talk to YPO. And I've always loved this particular group of people just because we're just so aligned in so many different ways. But, um, you know, I think for me as a child, um, you know, I think I grew up around a lot of physicians in our family. Mm -hmm. And it always really interested me. And I think just culturally, I think my my family was like, you know, you have two choices. You can either be an engineer or a doctor. So I really didn't even think outside of that. But what happened when I went to medical school was I was like this close to quitting, believe it or not. I was I was in it for three or four years and I just said to myself, this is not me. Like I don't I don't feel like this is really calling to me. There's it was dealing with a lot of sickness and illness. And then I ended up um and when I trained in medicine, too, an important part of the story was is right in the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And no one knew first what was causing it. And then mm. they found out what was causing it. And then they found out that it was pretty much untreatable. Right. We didn't have vaccine um, or any treatments for HIV for so long. And it was very depressing. The entire hospital was just filled with hundreds of people that were dying. And I, I just I just got depressed with all of medicine. I thought to myself, I can't do this. And then I spent one day in the operating room um, uh, as in my surgical rotation. And I was re-inspired by doing surgery with uh, with a very famous surgeon in Kansas City, Missouri, where I trained. And we were doing a heart surgery on an HIV positive patient, actually, um, who developed valve issues. And we actually ended up saving his life. And that person ended up living very long time. And so for me, 
going into surgery saved my career in medicine, actually. And mm -hmm. so what I, I did after I graduated from medical school, I went to the Mayo Clinic, trained in surgery, and then I started a practice. Um, this was way back in 2002. And uh, that was my YPO business, actually, was uh, I bought up some surgery centers, I hired some doctors and kind of grew this big surgical practice in my early years. You were very young when you were getting started on this pathway. So did, did you have like the, an accelerated uh, high school program where you graduated high school very early? When, 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 did academics just naturally, you know, come kind of easy to you or was it a lot, a lot of work? Help me understand maybe that the, the pathway as a, as a young uh, individual. I'm thinking of myself when I'm 15 years old, I was playing Nintendo and playing, you know, soccer in the front yard. And here you are, you're going to medical school. So I'm just like, I I'm having a hard time processing, you know, how that happens. Yeah, I think I was a good student. You know, I skipped fourth grade and then I skipped a year of high school and then I skipped two years of college. Um, there was a special program in Kansas City um, where they did your college and your medical school together in six years, kind of like the European system versus eight years. Okay. Um, and uh, that that's what allowed me to skip a few years and graduate uh, a little bit earlier than most. But I think academics came pretty easy to me. I mm -hmm. still, you know, I still did all the things that kids do, but I really loved science. I loved math. And so I, I, I took a deep dive and just came naturally to me. And um, it was a lot of luck, to be honest with you. You know, I, I was able to finish enough classes. Um, we moved from New Jersey to California, and I had four extra classes in New Jersey for some reason. They're like, if you go to summer school, you can graduate a year early from high school. I'm like, yes, I want to do that. <laughs> and so I just, um, I just followed the path that was in front of me, I think. So when you're having this kind of existential crisis as a, a medical student and you're seeing these people around you that you're unable to help, uh, it's in your questioning, Hey, am I, am I actually able to do any good? And you walk into this operating room and, and through your knowledge and your expertise, and you see you and another surgeon who's literally able to save a man's life. And this individual is able to go on and have a, a, a long life and, you know, prosper, um, listening to you kind of talk about that. This inspires you. It's like, Hey, I can lean in here. I can make a difference in society. Uh, I can make a difference in a person's life. Uh, what else during this time frame uh, and about medicine that really inspired you to kind of continue to go down that path? I mean, and had you not gone down that path, were you what were you looking at? You know, other avenues? Were were you really about ready just to check out? No, yeah, I I, I was ready to check out just because it it, it all just seemed really fruitless to me. Like mm -hmm. we couldn't, we couldn't do anything for these poor people except, you know, give them pain medication, keep them out of pain. Mm -hmm. But then I think what really inspired me was there's a few things. One mm -hmm. was the ability to actually save lives with surgery. And so, you know, people come with a lot of different surgical conditions, incarcerated hernias, gunshot wounds, stabbings, car accidents, and to be able to take them to the operating room, open them up and fix them mm -hmm. and actually save their life. Like, you know, I mean, not to brag, but I think I've saved thousands of lives mm -hmm. by being able to do surgery for 20 plus years that I was doing it. And um, that's an incredible feeling, you know, Robert, like having someone come to you afterwards and say, you saved my life mm -hmm. and give you a big hug. And the family is, is just over the moon that someone was yeah. saved. I mean, it just, you know, just fills your soul that you're doing something of value here. And then secondly, you know, I loved the deep complexity of it. Um, surgery is so complex. Like you need to know not only everything about medicine, but everything about anatomy and also surgical technique. It is three X the amount of stuff that you would normally need to know being just a physician, you know? And so I love that. I did a lot of trauma surgery. And so even, you know, trauma surgery is not just being in the operating room and patching up the liver and removing a damaged organ. It's actually taking care of them in the ICU mm -hmm. and managing their ventilator and their drips and all these things. You do that as a trauma surgeon. And I just love that deep complexity of it. And then finally, you know, I just thought to myself, that being in the operating room and being in the intensive care unit and doing the things that I'm doing, I'm doing things that most people never get to really experience, almost like kind of like being an astronaut or, or being, you know, an explorer. And just, I, I just felt so much, uh, um, I would say just pride in that, mm -hmm. that I was able to do something that a lot of people never really get to see, just so much awe, actually, mm -hmm. more than anything. And so I think those three things just kept me going for a very long time in the field of surgery. As I listen to you articulate all, all, all the complexity of this, it, it also sounds like there's a, 
uh, an art and a science to a surgeon. It's not like it's not just science, but there there's like this artistic being able to you're you're crafting and creating something in every single surgery or every single uh, patient that comes through the door. It's something new. It's something unique. And I could you know just see you get excited talking about almost the artistic side of medicine. Absolutely. I mean, it is every single human being is different, uh, not just from the outside, but also from the inside. And um, to be able to do kind of like the minuscule things that you have to do in some of these mm-hmm. procedures, like, for example, liver transplant, right? You you need to suture arteries, veins, bile ducts together from someone else's liver into someone else's body and match things up and be able to really figure out how to get this thing to work. Um it is is it's borders on just you know a complete art. Like every single operation is completely different from the one you've done before, and um, yeah, it's 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 I love it. You apply certain rules and you're able to follow those rules, but then every you're kind of also making it up as you go along for every single procedure because every person is so different. Well, I want to get into the uh, longevity movement that we have here, not just in the United States but globally. It seems to be like the the word of the day. So many people are excited about it. I know this is a part of your practice now, Uh, but before we do, I've got so many questions from people who knew that I was going to be interviewing you and were sending me uh, questions in to ask, but I want to kind of uh, quickly take a a side detour because here you are as this medical doctor, one of the youngest doctors in all of America. You're passionate about what you're doing. There's this art and science, but somewhere along the way, you also have this itch to be like, you know what? I'm going to create a business. I'm going to become, I want to be a, a businessman as well. And I'm going to open up medical practices and uh, surgical clinics. I, I want to understand the thinking, what's going on. Because there's so many people, you're, you're, you're impacting the world. You'd be like, hey, I can, uh, I'm doing a great job. I can stay here in the hospital. I can stay in the ER. But all of a sudden, you start to flex your capabilities outside of the medical profession into a, a, a business realm. And I remember how impressed I was w- when I met you for the very first time in our program. You were one of the only doctors there running a very large, uh, extremely successful business and coming to Harvard Business School, learning how to um, you know, scale it and grow it. I was like, wow, this is absolutely fascinating. But help me understand the process of you wanting to venture out and uh, grow these surgical centers and how, how you even started down that pathway. Right, right. Uh, some of it, once again, is luck. I kind of tripped into it, I say sometimes, because, you know, I got so busy doing what I was doing and they wouldn't give me enough operating room time at the hospital. And they give me, they give me, um, you know, grief about adding more cases on, et cetera, et cetera. And I just said, you know what, like, I, I need to be able to operate when I want to operate because th- these people, they need the surgeries. And mm-hmm. so I ended up buying a surgery center for myself and I operated at my surgery center. And then when people found out they can get in to see me and have surgery done, more people came. And then so I got too busy to where I could, I was booked out for months. And I said to, and then at that point, I was like, you know, I need to hire some help here. So mm-hmm. I hired a surgeon to help me, um, actually someone I trained with. And then um, that person ended up, you know, taking up another operating room. And then we needed to buy another surgery center because we were getting too busy. And so some of it just happened from uh, just sheer necessity of the Mm -hmm. community that I was in. But secondly, I think also, um, you know, as you buy these centers and you hire individuals, you quickly realize like it's a completely different skill set from being a doctor, right? You have to be able to run a business and then you need to have a third skill set, which is to be a leader. So these are all different skill sets that you need to develop. And whenever um, I didn't know something about a particular operation that I needed to do or a particular medical fact that I needed to chase down, I always just go to the books, right? And mm-hmm. the answer is in a book somewhere. So the same kind of philosophy I used with managing running the business, I ended up um, buying Vern Harnish's books on how to you know, Rockefeller habits mm-hmm. and how to set up your business. And then, uh, and um, I ended up actually inviting him to speak to our YPO chapter uh, many years later. Um, but, um, you know, I just, I, I took a deep dive into Rockefeller habits and um, I just implemented everything in the business. And I just said, this is actually a lot of fun. Like, I love doing this. Like the things that were in this book and good to great and all these other books that I was reading actually work. And so that, that was kind of fun too, because now I'd found this, secondary outlet of um, being able to create something new, which is creating a business. Did you find it difficult in, in one aspect of your life, your 
probably one of the most uh, w- maybe well-known, well-trained, prestigious surgeons, uh, advanced accolades in all these uh, areas in the in the medical world, and then uh, transitioning into the business world. It's in, in some respects you, you probably didn't have a ton of training and expertise there. You're almost going back to like square one. So on one hand, you're this advanced expert. On the other hand, you're almost like a novice, starting from square one, building something and learning. Did you find that to be enjoyable? Did you find certain things that you had learned in in your journey as a uh, a doctor and a surgeon that you were able to apply into business. What type of th- things or crossovers uh, did you have? I, just for the young people who are listening, and you know, maybe in a but one of the reasons why I'm asking that question is I have a uh, son-in-law who's in his second year of medical school at Marshall, and he sent me a whole slew of of questions, and so I'm I'm, I'm specifically uh, asking a few questions for my son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, that that is that is a fantastic question. And yes, Robert, I was starting at square one. Uh, um, in re- opening and running and managing a business. And um, part of it I found inspiring um, mm-hmm. because I was able to like read and mm-hmm. I was able to communicate with other businessmen. And I found I, I was learning new things. I-, I liked that part of it. What I didn't like was making all the mistakes you have to make to, to, <laughs> you know, to learn how to run a business. Right. And so I found myself making I feel like I made every single mistake you could possibly make in setting up the business and running the business. Um, and um, I learned from every single one of them, of course, but it was a slog. It was mm-hmm. tough. It was really, really hard um, the first few years of getting this thing up and going for sure. But you know what? Like I look at every failure as an opportunity mm-hmm. to learn something and to do it differently next time. And And the other thing that always kept me going too was, a lot of my contemporary doctors who were doing kind of the same things were, um, were, I mean, there were very few of them, right? Very Mm -hmm. few doctors end up successfully running a scalable business. Mm -hmm. And um, I just thought to myself, like, I'm doing something completely new that a lot of people that are, you know, my colleagues are not really doing. Mm -hmm. And so that was also a lot of fun for me as well. I know that there's probably so many things that you could choose from. You say, you know, learning from the mistakes and growing. But if if you were to encapsulate maybe one or two, maybe three things that you can remember right now, be like, man, if I could do it all over again, here are two or three of the the the, the most important lessons I learned as a doctor starting my medical practice business. Um, what would those be? I mean, if you're off the top of your head. Absolutely. And you know what? It's so funny you asked me this question because um, I had a t- uh, talk with my nephews about exactly this. They're going to college right now. One of them wants to be a lawyer, another professional, mm-hmm. another one wants to be a doctor. And they're like, you know, how do we bridge the gap between being a professional and also wanting to run a business? And I think the first thing I I would have told my younger self, my 20 year old self is, you know, decide very early that that's what you want to do, you know, because I think I had my foot in both camps for way too long. I was working 12 hours a day as a doctor and then all my spare time I was running the business and I wasn't doing either one very well and my personal health Mm. and and suffered during that time. Well, that's the next part of the story. Um, So that, that would be one thing is just have a very mindful kind of approach to how and when you're going to transition and the amount of time you're going to dedicate to both so that you don't, um, so that you don't suffer at a personal level, but Mm. also both aspects, the business and the professional um, get equal um, attention and care. Mm. So that, that would be one of my biggest, learnings from back then. Secondly, is that, you know, I went into the business aspect of this without, with zero business education, Mm -hmm. like zero. So um, I learned everything from, like you said, from the ground up, right? And so if you're in a position where you can learn before you do, highly suggest you do do that instead, you know, but whether you don't need to get an MBA, I don't think everyone needs an MBA, but I do think people do need some formal courses on marketing and, and, um, you know, strategy and those kind of things. Like I had no strategy when I started Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, my strategy was to survive Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) survival mode. Um, and I think having a strategy is so important. And this is all the stuff that I learned from HBS actually. Well, I know that a lot of times people can make uh, critical errors early on, and even 
founding the business, right? The, the, the foundational paperwork, the operating agreements, right? The contracts, so the, the, the types of partners that you bring in. Yeah, a, a lot of times it can look like it's like, oh, this is just easy stuff. And you don't even think about it until there's a crisis. And all of a sudden you go back to that operating agreement, you go back to that contract, and you're like, oh my goodness, I wish I didn't have this partner with me, or I didn't wish we, I wish we didn't have this clause. So having somebody, for me, um, my learning lessons have been uh, the, the exact same way. And so anytime now that I have a question where I can reach out to somebody who's a little older, maybe wiser, somebody who's gone down that path and I can learn from their mistakes, I can get advice from a, a mentor or a coach. Uh, it has been so valuable for me to be able to, you know, have those people that you can reach out to and you know, like our, our own classmates. I mean, there's it's routine and I'll, I'll, and in my forum, you know, I'll talk to, like, hey, have you guys ever done this? Have you guys ever had this type of obstacle or this type of issue? And it's amazing when someone can give you real firsthand experience and then it just like it supercharges and it, it, it sh it's a shortcut uh, to your ultimate success. So highly uh, recommend that for young people who are listening. Absolutely. And you, you hit the nail right in the head there. I think another that brings up another mistake I made and something I would have done very differently from the very beginning is I did everything in a total bubble or a silo just mm -hmm. by myself. I didn't reach out to people and ask questions and get advice, people that had done it before. And what a huge mistake. I mean, I, I from the moment I joined YPO and got a YPO forum, mm -hmm. it just completely changed my life because now I finally have a group of people I could talk to about business, which was very different than the vacuum that I was operating in prior to YPO. Well, you, you had a perfect segue a second ago uh, uh, about this transformation that you have in your mind and kind of moving maybe yourself and a little bit of your practice into the, the longevity movement, which is, it seems like it's just all around us. And I've been watching some of your uh, videos, not only on uh, LinkedIn, but also on in, uh, Instagram. And you were very open about a part of your journey where you were recounting in one of these videos how busy you were as a, as a young professional and you had put on some weight and your health you weren't uh, um, your health wasn't like number one for you and then all of a sudden you decide you know what I'm gonna change a few things in my life and all of a sudden you went through this almost like metamorphosis you 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 changed and l t talk a little bit about some of the things that you discovered and as you are personally changing how then you that leads into this like new uh, aspect of your practice yeah no that, that's a great part of the story so um I waited uh, a long time to get married and have kids, and uh, I was uh, 40 years old when I had my son. And I didn't just gain a little bit of weight; I gained 50, I was 50 pounds overweight. I was on three blood pressure medications. I was pre-diabetic on glucophage, and I was, uh, you know, having joint pains, which were probably due to some autoimmune issue that was there trying to figure out what it was. And so I was, I was pretty sick. And I, you know, just looking at the actuarial tables mm -hmm. of kind of like my biomarkers and how long. I I, what is my mortality rate in the next mm -hmm. 20 years? Things were not looking good for me to make it to my son's, you know, high school graduation or never mind, you know, his marriage and things mm -hmm. like that. And I just thought like, this is not acceptable. I was totally stressed out. I was working, um, you know, in, on the business and in the business, uh, seven days a week, 14 hours a day, not sleeping good, eating whatever was put in front of me and a large quantity of it. And just, just super sick and not, not taking care of myself. You know, as we all know, like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, the last priority becomes you, mm -hmm. especially when you have a, uh, especially when you have a family, right? Yeah. Like you just, just gotta, you gotta take care of everyone else, um, your employees, your business, your family, and then you make yourself the last priority. And that's exactly what happened to me. And um, I had this revelation when we, when I had my son, that um, I was going, I was just way too sick. And this happened exactly, I would say, eight and a half years ago, um, nine years ago, when when this when this revelation happened. And um, back then, there was no longevity movement like this. The longevity buzzword really happened in the last five years. So. I was just trying to get myself healthy. So I took some time off of working in the business and on the business. I hired someone to help me run the business. And um, I, I went down from five days of surgery a week to two days of surgery a week. And I went out there to learn how to get myself healthy. Um, I had a concierge physician. He mm. was very unhelpful. He was a typical Western medicine physician that just wanted to put me on more pills. Mm. And I just said, I, I, I can't be on any more pills. I was already on like 10 of them. And so um, I went out and I, 
took the NASM courses for becoming a personal trainer. I became a registered dietitian on my own. And then I found this field, new kind of thinking in medicine called functional medicine, which is really focusing on disease at its root cause rather than treating it with a pill or a surgery. Mm -hmm. And I learned everything I could within the course of, you know, eight months to a year. And as I was learning, I was applying my learnings to myself, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute, this is all I needed to do was I just, I needed to modify my diet, my sleep, my exercise, treat my gut, et cetera. And I was getting so healthy very quickly. Like within eight months, I lost 40 pounds. I got off my blood pressure medications. I got off um, um, my medication for my prediabetes as well. Mm -hmm. And during this time, I was teaching my patients how to do the same thing because I had so many patients that were also unhealthy mm -hmm. that needed surgery. And I just said, look, here's what I'm doing. You should try this. And they would do it and they would start getting healthy. And some of them then didn't need the surgery that they were signed up for as well. You know, and mm -hmm. so and I was like, fine with that. I was like, you're following. And so then uh, and once I recognized that there was a new way to practice medicine, I was like, this is this is a revolution. This is what I want to do. I want to do health up. I want to get people healthy, not, you know, just treat people with surgery and pills. And so that's when I started my next business, Next Health, which was um, eight years ago. We started in a small kind of a 2000 square foot location in West Hollywood. And it, and um, everyone, it took a while to explain to people what we were doing. Like we were defining a new category, mm -hmm. a health optimization and longevity center. No one really knew what that was. And um, so, you know, just like any new business in a blue ocean of, of clients out there, you need to explain what it is. It's a big educational curve. But once I started telling people what we were doing, it just blew up here in Los Angeles. And since then, it's, you know, we've been growing and growing the new business. So I recently uh, actually retired from doing surgery <laughs> about a few months ago. And now I'm 100% focused on uh, this longevity business next time. Just out of curiosity, what was your specialty in surgery? I mean, were you a, a general surgeon? You could do anything and everything, or did you focus on one particular thing? Because I'm remembering one of the cases that we had at HBS, and you were talking about the success rates of uh, open heart surgeries, these hospitals, I believe it was in India. And one of the, the, the critical things that they found out was that the more of them that you do, it's like you, you become like an expert. You, if you're having a surgery, you want to go to someone who's doing these like two or three times a day, not two or three times a month. Right. And so I'm just out of curiosity, what type of surgery were you an expert in? Yeah, so um, I like to reinvent myself every 10 years. So the first half of my career, I did general surgery and trauma surgery. Okay. And then the second half, I did plastic and reconstructive surgery. So um, I did a ton of reconstructive work, uh, uh, a lot of facial trauma work, a lot of uh, breast reconstruction after breast cancer, mm -hmm. a lot of cancer reconstruction on different parts of the body. And then over time, um, as we started buying surgery centers, um, we got more into the cosmetic aspects of things as well. And so here you are, you're the this... A uh, renowned doctor with all of this training in the medical career field, and yet you find yourself sick. You find yourself unhealthy, and you go through this year, two year long uh, discovery uh, in functional medicine, and, um, and you you create this new practice. I, I love the the name of it, Next Health. And here you are. So you're you're crafting a new category. You're trying to explain this. I'd, I'd love for you to unpack this uh, this. Uh, period of your life as you're building this new category, you're, uh, you're creating this new category in Los Angeles. Um, what, what, were some, what were some of the learnings? What are some of the things that are going on as you're trying to explain to people? It's like, hey, I don't want to just treat the, the, the trauma. I don't want to treat the, 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 the symptoms, but I want to be able to go to the root cause here and help you be able to you know, live a better life by making changes. I, I know a little bit about functional medicine based on some of the things that we've been doing in our company, but I'd love for you to be able to unpack that further. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there was kind of a convergence of a few other things uh, mm -hmm. that that kind of led to this kind of career change for me. One was, of course, you know, me being sick and my son being born. But on the business front, um, I had just started doing uh, HBS mm -hmm. um, about two years prior, and I loved HBS so much. I went into OPM, uh, the OPM program there. And so in OPM, one of the courses they take you down is strategy. One of the things you have to do in that strategy course in OPM is you have to write a paper on how you're going to um, what's your strategy for your business? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I wrote a paper on how I was going to expand the surgery center business. 
And I looked at it, this strategy, and I it was just so uninspiring. Like, it was just like, you know, buy more surgery centers, hire more surgeons, do more marketing. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really a strategy to do anything significant. And so I took that paper and I threw it away. And I said, you know what? I'm learning a lot about functional medicine. And I'm frustrated myself because I have to go to five different places and do all the things I need to do. I need to go to the hormone doctor to get my hormones fixed. I have to go to the hyperbaric chamber to do the hyperbaric stuff. I need to go to the nutritionist here to learn to get this. And so I said, I'm going to put all of this under one roof and create Next Health, which is going to be a health optimization and longevity center. And so I put that into a paper and I presented that to my professors at Harvard for my strategy. And then I really had something, you know? And so now I'm kind of doing things the way I wish I'd done my first business is to go into business with a strategy. How are we going to execute on this? And so um, the first part of that strategy was find a location and put everything under one roof. Mm -hmm. And the second part was now you can tell the story of what you're doing here. What are all these things you put under one roof? And so um, that's basically what I did. And, and um, you know, I partnered with a friend of mine who is more on the execution side. And I really just went ahead and went, went for the gold with it. And, um, you know, it's like with any new startup, it's a struggle at the beginning. Right. Um, telling the story was difficult, but then other people started seeing what we were doing and, um, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. We had a few people that kind of start doing the same things or pivot their business. And then the awareness level just started to rise at that point in time in Los Angeles, especially mm -hmm. of what is longevity medicine. And, um, we were the first place by years to, to create a place like this where everything was under one roof. And now there's a bunch of different businesses doing the same thing. So it's, um, it's, been, uh, it's been an incredible journey over the last eight years, kind of seeing the rise of longevity and health optimization. And I love it because, you know, there's so much attention on this now that it just really is it's been a huge boon to our business, but also for me mentally, mm -hmm. just being in this field and knowing the depth of knowledge that I know and the people I know and the and the and the um, and what's coming down the pipeline is just incredible. Do you have plans on uh, franchising this or taking it, you know, uh, national? Or are you going to stay kind of local there, where you can kind of, you know, be eyes and ears and hands on? Great question, Robert. So actually, um, for many years, we thought that we were going to just do corporate expansion. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have six locations right now. Um, we opened one in New York. We opened one in Hawaii. We have the rest in Los Angeles. And um, I would say four years ago, I decided like let me look at franchising. Like this growth is just too slow for mm -hmm. me. And then the pandemic hit and everything, all decisions got put on pause. Then we went into survival mode again mm -hmm. because all of our stores got shut down. And then uh, coming out of the pandemic, I said, you know what, we're going to franchise. And so about six months ago, we got our FDD done and um, we just started marketing our franchising two months ago. Wow. And we've already sold 50 locations um, in the last two months. And we're probably going to sell 150 locations in the next two years so we wow. we have a location opening in dubai that's our first international franchise that's opening um we have locations opening in las in las vegas in uh, scottsdale in santa barbara in seattle um mm. all over the nation miami and um i we're coming close to closing a deal to do 20 locations in australia as well so where the franchise route has been a massive massive growth curve for us that's fantastic well it, i'm i'm interested uh you know we have a number of health related issues here with the united states i mean many people would say that we've got a health crisis in the united states now, i'd love to get your insight on that and as you're listing all these various places where next health is opening up and where people are wanting to have a franchise you're talking you know miami and scottsdale and new york and dubai um these are places that uh, larger metropolitan areas, and also would typically uh, have higher median income, right? And so I'd, I'd love for you to maybe, if you can, unpack maybe some of the socioeconomic uh, issues that, that you see. Are, are certain demographics getting it? And do they have the, the is there this divide within the various populations? Because I, one of the, some of the things, the places that you didn't say Next Health was going was like a place like Mississippi or a West Virginia or some of these places where we know there is just absolute crisis. Um, obviously, it's, um, 
it's not that you're not interested in those those areas. It's just there's not an entrepreneur who's raising their hand saying, "Hey, I'd like to open up a a, a Next Health in Charleston, West Virginia, or you know, someplace in in Mississippi." So help me unpack a little bit of this because it feels like there's this like just like there's a digital divide within the United States there also seem it feels like there's also a health divide where there's a a segment of the population who get it and also have the resources to be able to have their uh, concierge medical service and then there's a group of there's also folks that are like it, it almost is like not important to them or maybe they don't have the resources um, I'm uneducated on this, so I, I, I'm coming to you for for feedback and, and insight. What do you see? Right, absolutely. So um, there's a couple a couple of factors here. So one factor is that the entire nation, whether you're in a metropolitan area or in the Midwest and, and in some small city in Kansas, is sick, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are sicker in the metropolitan areas than they are in the um, in, in some of these rural areas. And um, I think. The, the major problem is been the lack of good information, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much conflicting bad information out there that people are just confused and then they give up, right? They don't know whether they should have a keto diet or a Mediterranean diet. They don't know if they should um, run on the treadmill or lift weights or not you know, and then they get analysis paralysis, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest problems is in the Pareto principle, the 20% of F energy that's going to get 80% of the result is just clearing up all the misinformation on health. And that's what I'm trying to do with, I'm writing a book right now um, with my social media, I'm going to be doing a podcast on what is the 20% of the information that's going to give you 80% of the difference on health. And mm -hmm. that is distributable, you know, to everybody. And all of that stuff costs zero money. You just right. have to be educated in it, right. you know? And so I think there's a huge movement and we're seeing it with podcasts and we're also seeing it with um, YouTube, et cetera, on educating the public. And I think we're going to start, and we are seeing, the, the, the statistics show we are seeing a reversal of the health crisis happening right now, which is incredible and amazing. Mm -hmm. The second part of it is, unfortunately, insurance only treats disease and they don't they don't pay for health prevention, optimization, and keeping people healthy, basically. And that's the sad part of it. And that's why we have to go to metropolitan areas where people have the disposable income mm -hmm. to partake in some of these services that we have, such as hormone therapy or even things like hyperbaric therapy, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, the hope is that that changes, and um, I think it will change. I think we... And I think there's an undeniable wave of technology that's coming that's going to make all of this completely democratized to the point where even someone in the middle of nowhere is going to have the ability, even just on their cell phone, to be able to do a lot of things that they can they can turn their health around completely. Well, you, you talk about the democratization of information. And one, one of the things that I'd, I'd like to double click on this because I feel like I'm a fairly well-read individual. I mean, I am, I'm constantly picking up periodicals, books. I mean, I've got, I'm, I'm looking at my bookshelf right here. I've got Peter Atiyah's uh, book actually here on my desk, right? Outlive, which I'm sure you've read, and I can't wait to read uh, your book. I see uh, Tony Robbins' Life Force. I've had that recommended to me by so many different people. Uh, Scott Walker's book on sleep. I'd love to get your uh input on the importance of sleep in our life. But here's the question I have for you and the, and the information. I will see an article that says you should not drink coffee. Coffee is bad for you. And then another article by another uh, well-known doctor with, with great accolades from an incredible university. Uh, coffee is amazing for you. You should drink it all the time. Then you'll, you'll see the same thing. You know, should never have any alcohol. Alcohol is bad for you. Then you'll see an article, oh, drink two cl uh, glasses of red wine a day. It's great for your heart. And there's just so much confusing information. Be like, so who's right? I mean, these are both doctors, right? They're, it, right? They're, they're, and so, but they have vastly different opinions. So one saying, no coffee, no alcohol. Another one saying, hey, drink coffee, drink, you know, a glass of red wine. It's great. Help me understand why there can be such differences of opinion on little things like that. And how do you know who's right and who's wrong? Yeah, that, that is a fantastic question. So you touched on two, you know, two items there that are big controversies, coffee and alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. And we know, and I think that everyone intuitively knows that too much of anything is going to be bad for you in some mm -hmm. way or the other, right? Now, whenever you have a topic like that, where there's controversy, there's back and forth, 
The reality is, is that there's probably not a one right answer that fits everyone's biology, okay? And so your biology could probably handle four cups of coffee a day, whereas mine can only handle one cup of coffee a day. Your biology might be only able to handle zero alcohol because, you know, it, it, it could lead to dementia in the future, whereas my biology metabolizes alcohol perfectly fine, and I could have two drinks a day, and it won't harm me, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think whenever you see controversy is probably an indicator to you that there's probably some truth in the middle and okay. it really depends on your individual biology the second part of your question is who do you trust and this is really really important you have so many people talking on social media right now mm -hmm. that have no idea about what they're talking about it, it, i listen to some of these videos and i'm just like are you kidding me like this like youtube should take this off because this is completely based on nothing to that person's opinion mm -hmm. so you really want to look at the credentials of who's talking what have they studied what have they learned and are they measured in what they say like do they are are, are they trying to sell you something or are they and are they like beating a drum or are they measured in what they say and are they referring to science and are they um are, are do they come with some form of credentials at the mm -hmm. end of the day you have to look at the credentials of the person that you're listening Listening to. That's great advice. I know my wife and I, if we've navigated, you know, so many different issues, we're trying to, you know, live healthy lives ourselves, uh, trying to do, you know, right by our children, and and you know, we're constantly reading these things, and we'll we'll have these conflicting articles. Well, this one says this, or this one says that. So, you know, just trying to make sense of all of it, and of course, you know, through. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic and there were widely different opinions on that and, you know, different doctors. So it's just, it is a very interesting time where it can be a little bit confusing to you know, navigate this labyrinth of all this information. I tell you, I cannot wait for your book to come out. Please let, it, let me know uh, when it is and we'll, we'll make sure everybody can get a copy of it. I've really enjoyed uh, two, two books that have really impacted me. Uh, Scott Walker's book on why we sleep. I'm, I'm sure you've you've read that one, um, and also uh, Dr. Peter Atia and his, his book. Um, are there anything? Uh, what, what, one of the questions I was going to ask you specifically um, about maybe let's let's first start with sleep, uh, the the importance of sleep. I was not. Oh, I knew sleep was important, but I had no concept of how it impacted, you know, potential early onset Alzheimer's or, you know, dementia and all these other, other aspects of health. Uh, what are, would you say to your clients, people that you're working with, hey, here's why sleep is important. This is what you should be doing. What's your thoughts on sleep? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me, do you mind if I take it one step back before we talk about sleep in particular? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to frame the conversation of health mm -hmm. into easily digestible um, bits of information about where you need to focus. So mm -hmm. I have this um, I have this model that I use in my patients, a paradigm called the wellness wheel. And it, this wheel has 12 segments on it. We start with the basics of nutrition, exercise, slash movement, and sleep. Now, everyone needs to get the basics right because the basics, like you'd mentioned with sleep, not just affect your risk of Alzheimer's, they affect they, all of these um, all the basics affect your risk of all chronic disease. So you got to get those three aspects right. And sleep is definitely one of those pillars, right? Okay. Well, secondly, um, then we move on to the next four topics, which are the four main killers of humans in the Western world. Those are cardiovascular disease, metabolic disease, cancer, and and neurodegenerative disease, of which okay. Alzheimer's is one of them. Okay. So then we double click on all four of those. And then once we make sure that you're not gonna die from one of these major chronic diseases that are killing you know, all of all of us, if you look at the CDC top 10 causes of death, mm -hmm. it's those four diseases plus accidents, okay? okay? Then we can move on to really optimizing your life from a functional medicine standpoint. So what does that mean? That means diving a little bit deeper into your health, hormones, gut health, detoxifying your life and also emotional health. And so that's where we get into get into functional medicine. And then lastly, once you have all that right, the basics, you know, chronic disease elimination and then functional medicine, then we can talk about longevity medicine and some of the exciting new stuff in longevity. So that's how I kind of frame it. And I like to use the concept of a wheel because I tell everyone, oh, this wheel is a flywheel, right? If you get one thing right, it's going to make everything else better. And if you get two things right, it's going to make everything else better. And then all things just get better on their own. So for this example of sleep that you mm -hmm. get, once you start sleeping better, 
guess what? You're going to start eating better. You're going to start moving more. Your risk of heart disease is going to go down. Your risk of Alzheimer's is going to get go down. Your hormones are going to be better. It helps across the board. And so it's really important to have this complete view of health rather than just focusing in on just on one thing. If Yes, sleep is super important. And we're going to talk about why in a second. But um, if you're sleeping seven to eight hours, but you're still eating processed food for every single meal, you're you're not going to make any headway mm-hmm. with your health. I love this concept. Thank you for backing up. And I, I want to stay parked on this for a little bit. Why don't you unpack this wheel? Pretend that you're coming in. I've got my forum. We're having a, a, a quick forum exercise and you're giving a, a, a quick tutorial or deep, uh, deep dive a, as you see fit and say, all right, guys, let's make sure that you're doing some of the basics, the things that you can do today, right now, to start getting this flywheel moving in the right direction. Pretend you're talking to, you know, eight guys who are at 50, right? So they're, we're all hitting that, that 50 year mark and we're wanting to make sure that we're getting into our fifties and we're optimizing this next decade of our life. What would you say to that group of YPOers? Yeah, I I do this all the time for YPO forums and also for chapters. And I love doing this because I, I, I just, I created this for myself. And it works so well for me and Mm -hmm. me being a 50 year old guy, like I am, my health right now is better than it was when I was in my twenties. And I have the biological age test to prove it. Like my biological Mm -hmm. age is 27 on on the testing. And I'll tell you how to do that for yourself as well. So the first thing you want to do is, um, first and foremost, you have to decide, and I have, I have forums sign a contract with themselves that you will become the CEO of your own health. I tell everyone, you guys all run businesses. Do you look at your KPIs once a year? and have a consultant tell you that they're fine or not fine, no one runs their business that way. You have total control of your KPIs of your business. You need to do that with your health too. So I give you a spreadsheet and I explain to you the top 15 biomarkers that are the KPIs of your health and how you need to follow them. Some of them are blood tests that are easily obtainable and other ones are just measurements like on a scale or with a measuring tape that you can make on your own body. That's step one is become the CEO of your own health. And for young people who might be listening in and, and don't know what KPI stands for, that's a key performance indicator. So I just wanted to hi- highlight that, but so, sorry to interrupt you. So the key performance indicators of your life, you got to own that. You have to know them. You've got to track them every single month. Exactly. And I don't care if you have a concierge doctor who's really good or not. You need to do this for yourself. You okay. need to have this spreadsheet as one of the spreadsheets that's kind of like lives on your tabs and your on your browser that you're that you're looking at at least on a quarterly basis. So once you've decided to do that, then we can start empowering you with the knowledge that you need to affect these KPIs, right? So let's we can start off with nutrition. I always tell people, you know, I always I, I love the Pareto principle. Like, what are the two or three things that you can do to cause the maximal amount of effect? That's what you want to do, right? And so the the number one thing that's been proven in research study over and over and over again with nutrition is eliminating ultra processed food from your diet ultra processed food is what's killing most of us and it's what's causing us to eat way too many calories it's hyper palatable they're empty calories so we have decreased nutrition which makes us very sick um, and also the the amount of sugar in it is directly toxic to our cells and so once you eliminate ultra processed food and just doing that one thing can make someone health totally like totally 180 on your health just by doing one thing eliminating ultra processed food and then you want to do two or three more things so then you want to really deep dive into how your body is handling sugar and insulin okay. and the way you do that is by wearing a continuous glucose monitor for about six weeks have you ever done this i've never done a glucose monitor no oh it's so easy now. You just go, go to a website. Like I like to use Levels Health. Okay. You order it. They send you everything you need. You just wear it for six weeks, and you learn what foods are causing your glucose to spike. And then you start eliminating those foods, and you change a few things in your dietary pattern. Like you'll eat your fibers and your vegetables first before your carbs. Like I know restaurants love to give you bread first. Mm-hmm. That's the exact wrong way of doing it. If you eat your fiber and vegetables first and your protein second and your carbs last, you'll keep your glucose curve flat and you won't have these glucose spikes. So okay. simple things like that. So CGM is another thing that I highly recommend. And then the last thing is really getting your protein intake right. So I tell everyone, you've got to know what 1.5 grams per kilogram of protein looks like for you. Okay. So do the math and then and, and then weigh it out, you know, get a little scale and weigh it out and know what that looks like. You only need to do this for a couple of weeks before you get a really good sense of what your protein intake should be. And just doing those two or three things, I know I sped through them, but, mm-hmm. you know, I can dive deeper, changes your life. 
Totally. It changes your relationship with food. It changes the amount of nutrition that your body can use. And not only will you lose weight, but you'll get less sick and you'll avoid all forms of chronic disease. So ultra, just to go back and make sure I understand and others understand uh, the definition of ultra processed foods, that would be anything that comes like in a bag or a package or something along those lines. So if you're eating healthy, just like it's vegetables, things that's grown uh, it, God makes, right? As opposed to things that come out of a package in a store. Would that, is that a simplified, overly simplific, uh, simplified way of maybe looking at it? Yeah, no, that, that, that is an excellent way of looking at it. Basically, anything with an ingredients list, mm -hmm. um, if someone needs to list out the ingredients and most of them sound like chemical names, that mm -hmm. is an ultra-processed food. So okay. a lot of the stuff that you can buy in the center of your supermarket, you know, like the frozen pizzas, the desserts that come in packages, even things like, you know, processed meats that mm -hmm. like the, some of the packaged deli meats and cheeses, all that stuff is ultra processed. There's a lot of chemicals in it. And, you know, they make it, the food companies make it that way so that you'll buy more of it, right? They're in the business of selling you food, right? Mm -hmm. So they want to keep you hungry and they want to keep it really tasty. Mm -hmm. And um, that's the stuff that's really, it's what is, Every 10% increase of processed food that you have over a baseline causes a 10% increased risk of all-cause mortality in the next 30 years. So oh my goodness. think about that number. Right, exactly. Just reducing that by 10% is a massive difference in your chances of death. Wow, that is amazing. All right, so we, we've probably got a bunch of people now that are going to be like, you know what, I'm going to start going to my farmer's, farmer's market. I'm going to be getting you know fresh fruits and vegetables much more often. So let's say you've got a bunch of people who are pivoting that direction. You know, I've also read a number of articles about the various pesticides and things that are being used on a, a lot of the things that are being grown. Do you have any advice for your clients, for uh, your patients, and say, okay, now that you're going out, you're, you're trying to eat healthy, here's the best place to go get these foods. Or if you're still going to, say, a Kroger or a Whole Foods, here's how to wash them, prepare them to make sure that you're not getting um, inadvertently pesticides or chemicals into, into your body, ingesting those that could also have a different, you know, adverse reaction for you? Yeah, that, that is a great question. So if you can buy from your farmer's market, those are going to be organic. Make sure it's organic, right? Okay. Organic foods are not treated with any pesticides and they are um, generally considered clean. And the reason I like farmer's markets is, you know, the food is not coming from hundreds of thousands of miles away and stored for long periods of times okay. as well, right? Okay. So it's coming from local. So eating okay. local, organic, whole foods is the key. Okay. Um, if you don't have access to that, the, the Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, has a list that they publish every year called the Dirty Dozen. These are foods that they have tested, vegetables and fruits that they have tested to have the highest level of pesticides in it. So you want to avoid those 12. And then everything else, like you said, we, we recommend washing washing thoroughly and making sure that it's as clean as possible for pesticides. Okay. Wow. This has been uh, absolutely fascinating information up to this particular point. I love uh, the flywheel concept that you've unpacked. I want to make sure that we uh, have various links in the show notes to where people can go out to your website uh, and, and not only take a look at the videos that you've produced, all the content that you've written, but they are actually able to get some of these things as well. Couple, I've, I've got a list here of some questions. I might want to do some rapid fire with you, but uh, outside of the, the things that you've already shared with us, I saw on your website that you have a Shaw. I believe it's called the Shaw Protocol or the Shaw Principle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Have you talked about that yet, or is that something diff different? How do we incorporate that into our lifestyle? So basically, um, that protocol is based on the wellness wheel, mm -hmm. and each one of these topics, uh, nutrition, sleep, exercise, et cetera, I have 10 things to do in rank order of how effective it'll be for your biology. And so that's the protocol. And so um, I have... Um, a presentation that I do for YPO chapters um, on uh, and businesses that have hired me to come out. And I do a presentation basically telling you the things that I've told you so far, Robert, mm -hmm. but also giving them the entire protocol. Here are the 10 things that you can do in rank order of the importance they are to your biology. And so you pick the top two or three that you want to implement um, on a monthly basis. And over the course of a year, you'll be able to go down the list completely 
up. And that's the protocol that we use. And so for people who engage with you, they're able to get this like dashboard or spreadsheet that they're able to start filling in this, that this data and tracking everything. So you make it uh, as easy as one, two, three. It sounds like exactly. Yeah. I try to simplify it as much as possible because you know, we're all busy yeah. and you just want to know what's going to work and you want to know what's going to work the best and you want to be able to track the results. Right. And so mm-hmm. I try to make it as seamless as possible for people. And what a lot of forums do too, is they'll, they'll assign one health officer for the forum and they'll hold themselves accountable in the forum. Mm-hmm. Every time you meet, like, did you do these things, you know? And so and let's see the, let's see the results. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year, let's see what happened to your inflammation levels, to your sugar levels, to your testosterone levels, et cetera. That's what my forum is doing. I mean, that we, we've kicked off this uh, this year of longevity, and we we have somebody who's holding everyone accountable. And I'm like, it's it, it was amazing. I've actually told some people, I cannot believe the physiological change I've had over the last 60 days because I knew I was showing up to a meeting where I was going to be held accountable and things that I've been talking about, be like, Oh yeah, I'm going to lose it. You know, X amount of weight, or I'm going to do this or do that. And I'm like, I do not want to go in and, you know, and be, and be the guy that's like, yeah, I didn't do it. So, right. So accountability actually really is a, it's a huge deal. It totally is. Yeah. Holding yourself accountable and having others hold you accountable. And, you know, we're all a little bit competitive. We Mm -hmm. want to have the most improvement too. So (laughs) we do the same thing in our forum as well. One of the questions I have for you is uh, regarding um, Ozempic. Now, I early in the conversation, you talked about being a spot in your life where you were on a number of different medications. You were, uh, you know, taking um, ver- various things, and you wanted to get off the pill. You wanted these various pills that you were being prescribed uh, for your health. We've heard. Uh, about the, the the radical body transformations that people are having because they're on this this new drug called Ozempic and you know they're they're losing weight rapidly, but it, it has also come out within the last few weeks uh, things that I'm hearing medical professionals saying something's odd here where it looks like people are actually losing lean mass and connective tissue and other things like that, but they're they're not actually losing body fat. Now, I don't know if this is a um, just a, a one-off report, but it, do, do you have any insight on that? And for patients that might be coming into your practice and saying, hey, I'd like to get on Ozempic because I want to lose some weight, uh, what would you share uh, for them? Because I'm, I'm hearing this with a lot of my friends and family members who are like, you know, swearing by th- this new protocol. Yeah. So let me clear up all the confusion on Ozempic for you very okay. quickly. So, um, Ozempic and Monjarno are the brand names of two peptide medications called semaglutide and ter- a peptide. Okay. Peptides are a new class of medication that mimic our own hormones. They're just, they're, peptides are small pieces of proteins that mimic what our own hormones do. And this particular hormone, GLP-1, causes us to feel a sense of not being hungry or full all the okay. time. Okay. So basically, these two peptide medications are incredibly effective of convincing us that we don't need to eat. And that's why people are losing weight. I think they are a miracle in medicine mm-hmm. that I don't even put in the same category as pills that treat illnesses like high blood pressure pills or things. Mm-hmm. That's like you're already you're you're already sick and now you're just you know covering up the sickness. Mm-hmm. What 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 these medications do is actually they help you stop eating because they convince you your brain that you're full. So every single person I put on uh, Ozempic or Monjarno, I I require them to do uh, four things. One is they have to get a panel of biomarkers done. I want to find out why is there another cause that you are unable to lose weight or you're overweight besides just the obvious, you know, overeating and stress that we have in our life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have hormone disturbances. A lot of people's thyroids are off. A lot of people have inflammation in their body. We don't know what it is. So we need to concurrently, while you're on the medication, treat the other potential causes of why you're sick, right? Secondly, the continuous glucose monitor. I want people to use this time period that they're on Ozempic and or Bonjarno to change their relationship with food. And the most effective way to do that is by wearing a continuous glucose monitor, okay? okay? Six weeks, re-educate yourself. There's a really good book out there. I wish I had wrote it, but I didn't. It's called The Glucose Revolution. It tells you how to manage your glucose curve. It's an excellent book, uh, Glucose Revolution. The last thing I'll say is that um, you're right. People are losing skeletal muscle mass and connective tissue when they're on 
these medications, but it's not because of the medication themselves, it's because they become undernourished. They stop eating not just carbohydrates and fats, but they also stop eating protein. And so I I require every single person that goes on these medications to buy a scale, and a very specific scale. It's called the InBody H20N scale that does a very good job of measuring your skeletal muscle mass. And I tell people, your job is to make sure that you're losing weight, but your skeletal muscle mass is staying the same or going up. And okay. the only way you can know that is with the bio impotence scale like this scale. And so um, there's two factors with maintaining your skeletal muscle mass and connective tissue. That is making sure you're getting enough protein intake and also making sure you're going to the gym and, and lifting weights, right? Okay. So I'm tracking, I'm seeing everyone that's on the medication on a monthly basis. We're looking at the app. We're in body. We're tracking those numbers. We're looking at the continuous glucose monitor, making sure they're changing their relationship with food. They're getting the education. I give them three books to read on on food and how to eat. And um, I've had very good success of getting people off the medication in six to eight months when we get their weight to a very comfortable level and them keeping their weight off. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. This is such great information. I know um, multiple members of uh, my family are going to be uh, really encouraged to hear um, what you've just had to share. All right. A couple of uh, questions that my forum and other friends had sent in. Um, let's see here. What are some of the most important things that a man can do in his late forties, early fifties to maximize his overall longevity? Yeah. Um, Pareto principle again, the 20% of stuff makes such a huge difference. Um, The stuff we talked about with diet, Mm -hmm. I also want to uh, double click on exercise and movement a little bit. Um, Being sedentary, just like ultra processed food for every 10% of um, time above a baseline that you're sedentary increases your risk of mortality by 10% as well. So making sure you're constantly moving. Every 45 minutes that you're sitting at a desk, you want to get up and walk around. I personally, I use a walking desk. I'm not, I'm not on it right now because we're filming this. So I want to be bouncing bouncing around. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Normally I'm on a walking desk all day long when I'm at a desk. Um, If you're in a car driving for more than an hour, you want to stop and take a break and move around, et cetera. So eliminating sedentary behavior, having a good exercise routine that includes strength training and also some aerobic exercise is very important. Sleep, as you mentioned, there's a lot lot of guys and 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 women too our age group that are in their 40s and they develop sleep apnea and sleep apnea is one of the number one causes of all forms of chronic disease at a very early age so making sure you don't have sleep apnea which is where you stop taking oxygen at night Mm -hmm. is extremely important and um, if you snore a lot if your wife or your husband tells you or your significant other tells you that you're waking up gasping for air in the middle of the night Mm -hmm. um, you wake up tired you probably have sleep apnea and you get it treated and then I would also say to maximize your longevity, you got to get rid of your visceral fat. That's the fat that lives in your abdomen around your organs. So if your um, if your belly, you know, if you kind of have a beer belly, if your waist measurement is greater than your hip measurement, it means you have visceral fat, and it means you got to start getting rid of the visceral fat with dietary exercise and sleep changes. And then lastly, getting your hormones checked. I think a lot of people don't realize that they're hormones plummet in their 40s and 50s and having normal hormone levels is critical to maintaining your health and longevity as well so all those things are probably going to be like your top things you need to focus on first and then you know like going down the wellness wheel there's going to be some things in every category that's going to maximize your longevity there's not going to be one thing there's no one pill in fact if you take one pill for longevity like rapamycin is a pill that everyone is taking now Mm -hmm. um but you're not doing any of these other things. You're totally wasting your money, and you can actually be causing more damage by doing by wow. taking therapeutics without treating your overall health first. Okay. What about um, you, we hear about uh, inflammation in the body and how important it is to reduce inflammation? Uh, it, let's say someone is uh, struggling or, or have been diagnosed with various forms of inflammation. What are some of the things that they could be doing to reduce the inflammation in their body? Yeah, it's a great question, Robert. So this is when um, we get to the part of the wellness wheel on gut health. I talk about inflammation. Mm -hmm. There's a great biomarker of inflammation. So a lot of people are like, if you're feeling inflammation, it's already been years that you've been experiencing inflammation. And so you want to check a biomarker that will tell you 
10, 15, 20 years before you start feeling it if you're getting inflamed, right? Mm -hmm. And that biomarker is HSCRP, highly sensitive C-reactive protein. Very easy one to test and very easy one to kind of follow. Is this, would you get, would, when you get a blood test, are they testing this in a blood test? Okay. Only if you ask for it. Only if you ask for it. Okay. Yeah. So what, what I do is I give all of my people that listen to me a list of the biomarkers you want to ask your doctor for. Okay. And, because they're not going to order it unless you ask for it. Gotcha. Okay. And it's cheap and easy and your insurance covers it. Um, so if you have inflammation, the reason I talk about it when I talk about gut health is 80% of the time is coming from poor gut health. Our gut is uh, protecting us from the outside environment five times more than our skin is. And that's because our gut has five times more surface area than our skin does. So um, our microbiome in our gut, which are the trillions of bacteria, fungi, and viruses that live synergistically with us in our gut are protecting us from the outside environment. When you take a non steroidal anti-inflammatory, an aspirin or an antibiotic, it's like a nuclear bomb to them. They, they get destroyed and they can't protect us from the outside environment. Toxins seep in mm -hmm. and we start getting inflamed. The other cause of inflammation that a lot of people don't talk about is oral health. So when you, if you have gingivitis cavities, that can cause a lot of inflammation in your body. Okay. So my protocol for inflammation is first check your HSCRP. Are you inflamed? If you are inflamed or if you're having any gut symptoms, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, we need to fix your gut. How do we fix your gut? We focus on prebiotics and probiotics, and we go through a list of those, and there's certain gut repair peptides you can also take, mm -hmm. and then usually that takes care of the inflammation. Also, I send you to the dentist to get your oral health checked. Do you have um, like products, supplements, things like that that you sell through your medical clinics or things like, um, I know like you can get like a probiotic and things of that nature, but if, if people are looking for those types of things, do you feel that those supplements are, are helpful and do you have those that you have at your clinics? We don't have supplements at our clinics, but I do recommend supplements to okay. people. Um, I'm not a big supplement pusher, but there's about four or five that everyone needs to take um, because most of us are deficient in it and there's excellent science showing that it can improve your health. Okay. And um, I, I'll give people recommendations on what supplements to take um, but they're made by other companies um just out of curiosity this is an aside i happen to be listening to uh, the all-in podcast i don't know if you're a fan of that podcast or not but it yeah. was david freeberg i believe has a, a company that he's invested in and they were talking about this about the microbiome in the gut and how it has such a huge impact not only on your overall health but also mental health and I think the product that they have, I've ordered a couple of bags of it myself. I've been using. I'm just curious what you, what your thoughts are on it. It's a, I think it's called Super Gut, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, I'm looking at my bag of Super Gut right now in front of me. Real? Are you really? Yes, so I love it, Super. Is it a, so? It's a Every good day. product. Yeah, Super Gut's a great product. It's a resistant starch. So okay. number one, it keeps your glucose levels under control. Secondly, there's a lot of protein in it, which is fantastic. Okay. And thirdly, it's an incredible probiotic, which will help your gut bacteria be more healthy. There's a huge gut brain connection. I think that's mm -hmm. what you're talking about yeah. um, with, with that he was talking about. And um, having a healthy gut microbiome is extremely beneficial to your brain health as well. Okay, well, maybe we can use that as a pivot into a brain health. There was so many questions from um, YPO members about mental health, executives who are dealing with mental health and needing to you know, protect their mental health with all the various challenges that are going on. Uh, we've got uh, members of our community who are concerned about Alzheimer's and maybe early onset dementia. Uh, let's wrap all of these mental health issues. And I, I know it's probably hard to do, but maybe into the, this one little section right here for people who are concerned about that. You, you've just highlighted working with your, your gut health and the microbiome. Is there any other um, recommendations that you would have for people to do to be thinking about before they contact you and get on your protocols? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, to me, the, you know, the brain is an incredibly complex organ, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's there's about three different things that we want to talk about with the brain. One is preventing a catastrophe 30 years down the line with Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases, mm -hmm. right? So having chronic brain issues that lead to a disease where, you know, that, that is debilitating like Alzheimer's. That's one, one okay. part of the brain. The second part of the brain that I talk about is 
emotional health, okay, and, and like mental health issues, like you said. So I talk about those two things separately because mm-hmm. they are, even though they're together, there's two different kind of right. protocols, for each one for each one of those. And then lastly, optimizing your brain and keeping your brain as sharp and as functional as possible for as long as possible, right? Okay. And even though those, those three things are interrelated and some of the things overlap, we have to talk about them separately. So let's double click on Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative disease for a second. Okay. So um, Alzheimer's, you have to get tested for a gene called APOE. Um, if you have the APOE4 variant, um, you have an increased risk of Alzheimer's. And if you do, that doesn't, it's not deterministic, which means it doesn't mean you're definitely going to have Alzheimer's. It just means there's a 12 times higher risk for you to get it if you have two copies of this gene. So what do you do in that case? Well, there's now blood tests that you can test for amyloid and tau protein, the two proteins that cause Alzheimer's in your blood. And that's incredibly beneficial now and this is just as of last year we finally have the ability to test for this really yes exactly so once you start seeing signs of those proteins in your blood sometimes 20 to 30 years before you develop alzheimer's you know it's time to start doing something about it what can you do about it all the things we're talking about will prevent alzheimer's okay there's a great book written by an incredible alzheimer's researcher called the end of alzheimer's i recommend everyone who has a family history of alzheimer's or is concerned about it buy that book and read it okay. excellent advice on preventing alzheimer's um moving moving over to the other group of um, mental ish, or brain issues is mental health issues, right? And so mental health issues is it's a three-pronged strategy to handle men- mental health issues in my mind. One is treating yourself physiologically, right? So a lot of times there are body issues such as hormones, gut health, et cetera, that can cause mental health issues like anxiety, depression, et cetera. A lot of times if you go to a, um, a psychologist, those are ignored because they don't they don't work with that part of mm-hmm. your health, right? And so having kind of that more holistic view, like how are my hormones affecting my mental health? Are they affecting my mental health is extremely important. So once again, getting testing done, biomarker testing done to okay. see if that's a potential cause of it. The second part of mental health issue is therapy. I, I, there's incredible advances in therapy that have happened over the last 10 years. Finding a good therapist and finding a good style of therapy that works for you that's really um, catered to the type of mental health issue that you're experiencing. Is it depression? Is it trauma? Is it anxiety? Is it ADHD? There's different types of therapy for each one. So finding the right therapist with the right modality is extremely important. And then lastly is medications. So there are medications that are extremely beneficial. I tell everyone, Use the medications temporarily until we figure out the physiology and the therapy side of it. Okay. Then you're going to wean off the medication. It's really important that you know that you you're not scared of medications. Very analogous to like the GLP medications, like Ozempic, Crutch, and only use that as the only modality of treatment okay. for mental health issues. You have to use it in a very specified amount of time period um, and with the eventual goal of getting off of it once you fix the other things. Okay. And in terms of the other, like, let's talk about uh, briefly the, the the capability of using a new tropic or these various new tropics that you can use. It, it, it helps you with word acquisition or memory. Uh, are you seeing signs of this or is this just marketing or are there really things that can help individuals perform at a super high level as an executive or as a student by taking certain supplements or vitamins uh, for cognitive function? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that if you don't have the other things right, Mm-hmm. Those things are a total waste of money okay. uh, and your time. If you if you if you did not sleep seven to eight hours a night before and get one and a half hours of deep sleep, and you're taking nootropic instead, you're just wasting your time and money. Okay. If you're going to McDonald's three meals a day, you're <laughs> you know you're wasting your time and money. Now, for the ultra healthy person, the one who's got all these other things correct, they, mm-hmm. they exercise on a regular basis, you know all these other things that we're talking about, then I do help people navigate the seas of nootropics, okay. right? And so there's some good ones, and there's, and I would say that's like 5% of the nootropics out mm-hmm. there. 95% of them are unproven, crappy, mm-hmm. poorly researched, and, and you know, you buy a bottle and you don't even know what's in it. It could be just sawdust in it, you know? A okay. lot of it is marketing. Right. So don't buy the ones that are on your Instagram. Like, really look into the science of okay. what works, I would say. Some of the nootropics that I do think, um, that, that I think would, would help people are, ashwagandha has a lot of great science behind it. I think okay. that's one that, that works. There's one that I've been following and 
and uh, I take myself sometimes called Qualia. Qualia, uh, they've done a really good deep dive in um, the science of nootropics, and it's kind of like a combination of multiple nootropics in one in one, which mm-hmm. and, which I like as well. And then lastly, um, there's some prescription ones that work extremely well. There's modafinil, which is um, typically prescribed to people that have narcolepsy. They you're falling asleep during mm-hmm. the day, yeah. but um, it's a prescription medication that. Um, creates an incredible amount of focus, kind of like the limitless bill. Okay. What about, what about, um, you, you hear the benefits of coconut oil or MCT oil for brain health and things like that. Are, are, are those things, supplements or things that people should be using? Is there a true connection of utilizing some of those in, in, in better health? Yeah, MCT oil, uh, which comes from coconut oil, is um, has been shown to cause um, increased levels of brain function for okay. sure. And so, um, I, I like you know, taking MCT oil a little bit in my coffee every morning. Okay. That's, that's what I do as well. I just wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing and I, I wasn't, um, w- wasting my time or money there. One, uh, uh, one final question here before I, uh, round out, uh, this segment, but, um, I, a close friend of mine asked me, he said, Bob, would you ask this question? I just, I want to make sure that I I'm getting some really good information on this, but what do you think of the, is it pre new? Pre-novo body scans, some think they are amazing at detecting cancers early, while other doctors say they are too generalized and not worth it. Did I pronounce that right? A pre-novo, pre-novo scans? Pre-novo, yep. So Pre-novo is a company, it's a YPOR's company, actually, really great guy, Andrew from, um, from Canada. Okay. He, um, he democratized the ability to get a full body MRI. Okay? okay. So it's basically a full body MRI. Same MRI machine that's in hospital, or if you had an orthopedic injury, they they can do this MRI on okay. you. Okay, um, it's an incredible screening tool. I actually really like it as a screening tool for anatomical abnormalities okay. and some forms of cancer. And that's very key wording there: some forms of cancer. Okay, anatomic abnormalities occur in a significant percentage of us, and we just don't know until it's too late. Some of them include things like aneurysms, right? People are surprised when their aneurysms burst and they end up in the hospital or they die, and that's because they never knew they had one. Well, with one of these full-body MRI, is not good at detecting all forms of cancer, but it is good at detecting many forms of cancer, okay? So you can't use this full-body MRI and get one done and say, okay, I'm clear, I don't need to get any other screening modalities for cancer. Cancer screening has come an incredibly long way in the last five years. So there's a new test called liquid biopsy that I also recommend for all of my patients to get. It's a blood test. It detects what's called cell-free DNA in your blood from cancer. So if there's 50 different kinds of cancer that it can detect in your blood, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, bile duct cancer. Um, very early, the very beginning so, um, signs of, ca- of cancer. Okay. Years and probably decades before you'll have any symptoms. I always say that you know if a full body MRI and the and the liquid biopsy test was still was around even 15 years ago, Steve Jobs would be alive today. But we have access to this now. This wow. technology is there. It's extremely effective, and I think all of us should look into getting a full body MRI in this uh, liquid biopsy grail test, probably starting at the age of 45, 50, okay. you know, 40 if, if, you're, if you're motivated. Um, you know, you have to be tolerant of certain things if you're getting a full body MRI and the liquid biopsy. There's gonna be false positives. There's gonna be going down a rabbit hole of like, wait, what was that? What is that? Mm-hmm. And doing more testing. If you're tolerant of that, um, and you're not gonna, you know, have a mental breakdown because they found something, mm-hmm then you're a good candidate for it. Okay. If, however, you're one of those people that are like, I just don't want to know, <laughs> yeah. it's probably not a good idea. Because sometimes, you know, a small percentage of the times, you'll find something that sends you down a diagnostic rabbit hole. And, um, you know, you as the patient need to be tolerant of kind of the, the mm. flips and turns you have to make if that happens. Just seems like such an exciting time to be alive right now. When I talk to you and I talk to other uh, professionals that are in the, the medical or technology space, it seems like technology and everything that's happening in life sciences is just rapidly accelerating and we're learning and discovering new things. I mean, if you were to look out just like a couple of years, it you, I'm hearing people like yourself say, gosh, you know, life expectancy ought to be increasing because of all these advancements. Do you have that level of excitement and anticipation of the advancements of technology and how it's going to impact uh, the way that we live and operate? I mean, what's your, your forecast, your crystal ball? 
Yeah, 100%. I am extremely excited. And so what I would say is if you look at the CDC top 10 causes of death that I talked about at the beginning mm -hmm. of our conversation, yep. all of those things are going to become orphan diseases eventually. Okay. For you and I that have access and knowledge, um, it's going to become an orphan disease in our lifetime. We should not die of a heart attack, a stroke, metabolic disease, or cancer until way, way late, maybe even after the age of 100, okay? okay. Um, so if you can take advantage of these things right now and educate yourself and, and, have, um, and have the ability to do these things, you can protect yourself from some of these things that typically cause us to die. Um, on top of that, the molecules and the level of discovery that we're seeing on the um, just really going down to the root cause of why cells age on a cellular level, on a biochemical level, the amount of knowledge that we're gaining there is incredible. And it's so rapid fire right now, it's ridiculous because you have people like, you know, like a Bill Gates and um, Zuckerberg, um, Bezos spending hundreds of millions of dollars of their own money funding companies like Calico, Biosciences, et cetera, that that's their main mandate is figure out at a cellular level how we turn back the biological age clock. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen. And it's going to happen during our lifetime. I'm very optimistic about it just because, you know, you look at the rate of technology um, increase right now and with biology and technology becoming merging into one field, the exponential increase of knowledge that we're gaining is magnificent right now. And so things are going to come faster and faster and faster, faster than we can even anticipate. Just mm -hmm. like ChatGPT kind of yeah. knocked our socks off a few months ago. I really feel like there's going to be a medication or a or a or a therapeutic that's going to come out that's also going to knock our socks off in the next few years. Well, I tell you what, I can't thank you enough for your time and uh, all the information that you've shared with us today. I know that I've got a, a bunch of forum mates who are going to be excited about this and we can't wait to get out there to Malibu and uh, go through the entire protocol from start to finish. I've got uh, two more questions for you. I appreciate uh, your, your generosity and uh, helping everybody who's listening today with all of this information, but rapid fire questions. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear this life changing book? Peter Atia outlive. For most people, I would say could be a real game changer. For me, it was actually Food, What the Heck Should I Eat by Dr. Mark Hyman. Okay. First book I read in the health space, totally changed my life. Okay. Best book that you've read this last year? Outlive okay. was the one I read just recently. I read it twice, actually. Oh, wow. It's, it's that good. All right. So every, yeah, every, Peter, did a, Peter did a really, really good job okay. of framing longevity and, and health and everything that we're talking about today. Um, I would say that that would be my number one. I also really love this book called uh, Built to Move okay. by the Starlets, uh, Starrets, and um, it's an excellent book about keeping your body functional as you age. Okay. Favorite course in college? I would say that was statistics. Wow. All right. I wasn't expecting that. Okay. Favorite HBS professor? <laughs> Groisberg. All right. All right. Uh, my, mine as well. Mine as well. Favorite place to travel? San Tropez. Oh, nice. All right. You're getting some good ones here. All right. Uh, the, the thing that's at the top of your bucket list right now. Oh, I just crossed off uh, flying in a fighter jet um, this July, which was amazing. What, what kind of fighter jet were you in? It was, a, it was a MIG training jet that they oh. used. To, it's called an Albatross. Okay. I did it in California. Nice. All yeah, right. So what, what, what's minutes. next? What's next? The next one is going to go to Antarctica. All right. Okay. That's a great one. All right. And final question. I'm, I'm changing this one a little bit. Um, I, I've been, uh, so I'm taking a, a slightly different approach on this question. I've asked a lot of our, our classmates, but since you're a doctor and you are specifically focused on helping people with longevity, let's pretend that uh, the American president, Joe Biden, has asked you to give a State of the Union address to the American people. And he knows that we've got a health crisis in the United States, and he's asked you uh, at night on national television to address the American people and just give them a word of encouragement, where to start, what to do. I know you've already highlighted a couple of these things, but you, you've got an open mic to the entire American people. Uh, what would you say? How would you encourage them? Yeah, I would tell them a few things. I'll say, number one, be positive about this. It's definitely everyone can change their health around for sure. Um, so if you come at it with positivity rather than a feeling of just defeat, um, that's step one, two, and three. So that's what I always talk to my patients about is first, 
We're going to get this. We're going to do this and you're going to get healthier. I promise you. Secondly, is that Mr. Biden, Mm -hmm. I would love for you to mandate Medicare cover the liquid biopsy test so we can eliminate cancer, a continuous glucose monitor for every human in America so we can get rid of diabetes, an exercise program at a gym, a free membership so everyone can get moving, right? And lastly, um, uh, lastly, uh, APOB test, a, cholesterol, a specific kind of cholesterol test, and a calcium score of your heart for everyone over the age of 40 so we can pre-diagnose cardiovascular disease before someone has a heart attack. Those four things, I think, if Medicare can cover it, we will make the top five reasons people die mm-hmm. orphan diseases in America. Well, that's a, a great word, encouraging word for not only the American people, but people listening around the world. And yeah, it, it's shocking that, you know, to learn that so many of these things that could be preventative just aren't covered by our insurance companies and things along those lines. And so hopefully we'll get a, a group of leaders who are able to, um, you know, help change some of these, these, these laws and, uh, and things like that. So where people can have access to these life changing, um, treatments, right? And various, and various protocols. But Darshan, I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity today, your time. I, you're certainly going to be hearing more from me in my form, and I'm sure many other uh, YPOers and people around the country who are wanting to engage uh, and chat with you. We're going to make sure to put all of your uh, contact information and links to your website and so forth in the show notes so people know exactly where to go and learn more. But uh, it, it's so needed. And I think that you've, you've taken a very complex subject where uh, it, it's hard to kind of navigate all the information that's out there. You've made it just so easy, uh, so approachable um, and for a, guy, a simple guy like me to be able to understand it. So I just want to say thank you. And it's, it's always good being able to spend some time with you. And it's been uh, far too long since we've been able to engage. And I just want to say thank you for um, taking the time to be on the podcast today. Oh, you're so welcome, Robert. This was so much fun for me, and you're such an incredible interview, I must say. <laughs> you, you got me to talk about almost everything I love talking about and I'm passionate about, and uh, I really appreciate talking to my fellow YPOers. YPO has made a gigantic difference in my life, and I'm so happy to be able to give back. Oh, me, me as well. Well, thank you, my friend, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot, a lot of our friends reaching out and scheduling visits there to Malibu, so uh, <laughs> get ready. Get ready. Fantastic. Right. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Today's episode was engineered by Mitch White with graphic and marketing by Tristan White. Special thanks to Dr. Shaw for investing time to share with our listeners his story and learnings from his journey. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or wherever you go to listen to your favorite pods. If you like the show, please share it with a friend and give us a review. That's always appreciated. Thank you for spending time with us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week.